there we go. Hello. Thank you for being here and for accommodating our time change. Um, it may end up just being you and Lisa Newt, which is great news because then you get to talk a little bit longer than we planned for. <laughs> um, so I hope you appreciate the, uh, <laughs> the extra space and I appreciate your flexibility. Uh, thanks to our attendees. Um, my name is Alex Baca. I'm with Greater Greater Washington. Um, Alex Coma with Washington City Paper is moderating. Uh, we are super glad to have him here. Um, and I don't have too, too many, you know, remarks to say, um, other than that, um, I will have to share my screen so you can see a timer because as a small local nonprofit, we have maxed out our free use of blue sky timer. Um, so look at my screen to see your countdown. You'll have one minute for most questions unless we note otherwise. Um, and I will, I, I think again, we can be a little bit flexible with time tonight, but uh, be conservative. Uh, we have a lot to get through um, and I'm super excited to hear from you both. Um, Alex, any other comments? No, no, I, I would echo uh, your thanks. Uh, we are of course uh, thrilled to be participating here at Washington City Paper where we cover all things local politics. If you didn't know that already, uh, we would encourage you to go on over to WashingtonCityPaper.com and, and check out our work um, featuring the at-large race among the many fine races happening uh, in 2022 this year. And uh, excited to hear what these folks have to say about it all. Um, cool. Um, so we're going to kick you off for 30 seconds with opening statements. Um, give me a moment to share my screen. And I'm going to say, uh, Nate, I am looking at you first. So um, why don't you? Um, and can you see the timer here? Yes. Great. Um, OK, um, I'm going to start this and I'll turn it over to Alex for questions. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead. Is it my opening statement? OK, can we reset it, please? Yeah, I'm actually sorry. <laughs> I was all ready for the one minute, so um, hold, please. There we go. Okay. So 30 seconds for opening statement. Yep. Um, there you go. OK, got it. All right, well, briefly, my name is Nate Fleming. I formerly served as DC shadow representative and as a council staffer. So I've had an opportunity to work on the issues important to GGW, like housing, land use and transportation. I'm really proud of some of my accomplishments, particularly on the Housing Production Trust Fund, um, Community Land Trust, rent control, and some of my work on the last amendments to the comprehensive plan. I hope to discuss this in detail and I look forward to earning your endorsement. Thank you. All right, Lisa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Gore. I'm a proud third generation Washingtonian. I'm a DCPS mom. I'm also vice chair of ANC 34G here in Chevy Chase. As an ANC commissioner, I've worked on a lot of these issues. So Connecticut Avenue bike lanes, um, right now the small area plan for Connecticut Avenue that includes increased density. I'm happy to discuss these issues with you tonight and I'm look forward to, uh, looking forward to getting to know you, you guys to get to know me better. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much to you both. And, and now we will move into questions for real. Um, I will do my best to uh, alternate the order between the two of you. Um, so you get to uh, have turns uh, going first with just two of you. That makes it uh, a little bit easier. Now we're going to sort of start things off uh, in the realm of uh, housing and uh, land use. Um, uh, topics uh, well familiar to uh, any followers of Greater Greater Washington. So uh, to start things off, uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about Mayor Muriel Bowser's housing production uh, goal. That is, of course, the idea of uh, creating 36,000 uh, units by 2025, a third of which would be affordable. I'm curious if you two think that's been effective and if you think the responsibility for setting future uh, housing production goals should continue to lie with the mayor, uh, maybe that should be with the council instead or, or perhaps a mix of both. Um, so we will start things off. Uh, we'll have Lisa go first this time, uh, start in your minute. Thank you. Um, that's a great question. I think um, the goal is an appropriate goal. And I also think the goal being place based, supporting the strategies and having those um, planning area uh, goals is also appropriate. I would give it mixed results. I think it's done very well at the higher levels of affordability, but I think we can do a lot better in the lower areas of affordability. So that's basically zero, 30%. 
anywhere I'd say 30 to 50 percent AMI. Um, one of the things that I would like to see is better use of the housing production trust fund dollars. Um, and I think we could do uh, more in terms of strategies, particularly with IZ, IZ plus, which seems to be a, a predominant strategy of the administration. And um, that's not going to get us to where we need to be, especially at those lower affordability levels. I think it should probably be a mix between the uh, mayor and the council just to make sure we're having proper oversight of that goal. Thanks, Lisa. We'll turn it over to Nate for the same question on the goal. Yes, so um, I think the goal should be more ambitious. And I also believe that the goal as it relates to affordability should be more specified with specific specificity as it relates to targeted goals on the affordability levels. Um, I think as it relates to the Housing Production Trust Fund, I agree with Lisa that we spent too much money of the fund on 80% uh, AMI housing. And I think there's major gaps that we have in our housing portfolio. There's only 7,000 units in the entire city that are suitable for large families. Uh, we have gaps as it relates to seniors. So I believe that those goals should incorporate some of those needs as well. I believe that the government should play a role as a housing developer. I think we really should move forward with social housing. And finally, I believe the council has a role currently to um, set goals. They have, that they have that right if they choose to, and I believe that they should, but the mayor and the council have to work in collaboration. And right now we're not seeing that. Well, you both mentioned uh, the Housing Production Trust Fund, and that is exactly uh, where I wanted to take this discussion. Um, you know, specifically, I wanted to ask you both what you believe the best use of HPTF dollars really is. Um, you know, to me, I see that as a divide between, on the one hand, you can aim to build as much new housing as possible to meet the rising demand that we do know that's out there, even if that ends up meaning that that housing is concentrated in the same few areas of the city, uh, very similar to the dynamic we see now, or whether that use of that money is better spent to address the high cost of building in expensive and perhaps more exclusive uh, neighborhoods. It's just, you know, way harder to build in, in Ward 3. That's gonna, your dollars aren't gonna take you nearly as far, but maybe your goals of inclusion are, are worth it more to you. So I'm curious what you think about that. Nate, we'll start with you. So Alex, thank you for that question. I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think we should be doing several things. I think we should be using all available tools on our tool belt. And as a council staffer, I've thought about how we can better use our HPTF dollars, and I've tried to craft solutions to do with that. I was a staffer that drafted the law that changed the um, statutory requirements for this fund to mandate that 50% of the funds should go to extremely and very low income housing. Um, in doing that, I, I found out that there is a waiver that the mayor has that's in the statute. Um, so she can waive um, those requirements. We need to really look and, and, and narrow or remove the ability to waive at all. In addition to that, we have to um, do things like increase the use of the preservation fund. So when you talked about in areas where there's a high cost of the building affordability, we have to make sure that we're preserving that um, housing. I believe in social housing uh, where the government's the developer, that's another tool we can use and things like community land trust to keep land permanently affordable. Well, since there's only two of you, I'm gonna use my uh, moderator's prerogative and ask a quick follow-up. I'd love to know, Nate, so, you know, you, you mentioned the ability to do both, but don't you believe that there's a, a trade-off in uh, uh, doing, you know, both of these things? It, it sure seems like you're going to use a lot of money, you know, building in more expensive areas that may not be there uh, for, for projects elsewhere. Tell me more what you mean by that. Well, I mean, when you look at the assets that we dedicate to the um, Housing Production Trust Fund um, in a typical year, at least $100 million, there is a proposal for $500 million in this new budget. So I think the asset issue is less a concern, but more about um, the dollars that are being misfit and stronger oversight of the fund. And the, we've had issues such as $82 million being misspent in the fund. We've had the issues of um, projects that are scored lower than other projects re receiving the money. And I think we can get a better return on our investments by dealing with those issues. I think you're right. I mean, we have to deal with the trade-offs, but I believe that our need for affordable housing um, is strong throughout the city and we need to make sure that we're using other tools on our tool belt um, to, to get the most that we can get from that fund. Things like expanding social housing, 
things like expanding the preservation fund, things like using DOPA, things like using TOPA, things like expanding rent control. I think all of these things work together. All right, well, let's give Lisa a chance uh, to chime in on this question. Uh, for a refresher, it's essentially asking about the, the trade-offs inherent in uh, uh, how you spend uh-oh. Alex, you may be having some uh, headphone connectivity issues. I was going to say, was that him or me? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you seem to be back now. Where where did you lose me? In the question, you were going over the question. Oh, yeah. I, the same question. I was just refreshing it for you, thinking about trade-offs in the HPTF. How do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I I would really like to see the Housing Production Trust Fund used for its intended purpose, which is, you know, that deeply affordable housing. I would absolutely love to see it meet its statutory minimum requirement. Right now, I think it's at 50% of uh, creating housing for the need of 0 to 30%. I think only one time in the history of the Housing Production Trust Fund did it ever meet that statutory requirement. Um so the trade-off to me in my campaign is reflective of a just DC. So basically taking care of those people that need it most. And that is the level of affordability that's seeing the least production in DC. I would top that off by my years of experience as an oversight professional. And one of the things that is most critical right now to the Housing Production Trust Fund is appropriate oversight and making sure that we have a good handle on how that um, RFP process is being used, the uh, waivers that are being used throughout the Housing Production Trust Fund, so that we can ensure all of those dollars go to the number of units that we're trying to produce at those lower affordability uh, levels. So for me, sorry, Lisa, that's your one minute. So I don't, I don't want to try and keep you on time if I can. Okay. I'll just ask a, a quick follow-up, similar to, to Nate. I mean, you mentioned the statutory requirement, uh, the fact that it, it often uh, has proven elusive. Um, let me ask you this. I mean, in your mind, uh, as you say, there's a huge. Uh oh. Alex. Yep. Lost him again. Um, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> I can finish the, the question while he sorts it out, which I believe was going to be something along the lines of, um, you know, there are statutory requirements. Um, they haven't often been met. Um, yeah. You know, when we talk about more oversight, and I think this is going to be sort of a general theme throughout this conversation, um, you know, what exactly do you mean? Is it changing those requirements? Is it expanding something else? Is it more legislation? Is it changes to the code? You know, what, what is it that takes that oversight into action? Um, we'll you know, I think it's, first of all, part of that oversight is getting to the bottom of what's going on at DHCD and just with the letting of those contracts. So why do we have 82 million that has been misapplied at a particular level of affordability? Sometimes oversight is not legislative per se in that we need more legislation to do good oversight. To me, good oversight is a helping process in understanding what's going on at that agency that you're not meeting your goal. And in this case, it's that production goal of 50%. Um, so that good oversight could lead to better legislation, but it's asking the right questions, it's knowing what to ask, uh, it's having the hearings, and being dogmatic in doing so. Um, and that is grossly missing with a lot of our housing agencies, not just DHCD and not just Housing Production Trust Fund. Cool, thank you. I will turn it back over to other Alex. <laughs> yeah, I've refreshed my connection. So who knows, maybe this will keep happening. Let's hope not. Uh, I, I guess I would ask Lisa as a follow-up, you certainly mentioned lots of uh, oversight issues within HPTF that I think we all know are present. Um, but I'm curious, you know, what to you are, are you, you mentioned the, the $82 million referenced in the OIG report, but certainly the DC auditor has flagged other issues, uh, you know, projects uh, that were scored lower, you know, being the ones to receive it. Oh no. How do you believe that the council could use its oversight role 
to uh, make a difference on on these issues? What are the specific things you think you could do in this um, capacity? I definitely think, you know, the, first of all, I think they need to have hearings. I think the housing uh, committee, uh, committee on housing and executive administration needs to have hearings on that to make sure that we fully understand and that the issues in both the IG's report and the auditor's report are fully addressed and understood. Um, I watched uh, the uh, one here, and I believe that was held on housing production trust funds. Um, and um, you know, I don't, I don't believe that was a full hearing that got to the bottom of it. I would love to understand, you know, why we continue to have these projects waived. I believe there's legislation that says that that waiver, and I believe Nate mentioned this, that they're supposed to get a waiver. Uh, to the council if they don't go over or don't produce a certain number of units. Well, why does that not happen? Um, there's also things on uh, recommendations. So why are we having projects that are scoring lower and the lowest being accepted in lieu of projects that are scoring higher and at the same time losing units? Am yeah, I yeah let's let's uh, let's get Nate into this uh, conversation okay. as well. Um, you know, and and trust me, we'll we'll come back to this. But you know, essentially, the, the question is, you know, we all I think can agree that there is the need for you know oversight uh, of the HPTF and and DHCD broadly. You know, what would you uh, bring to this, and and how do you think you could make a difference on it? Thank you. So let me, let, once again, this is a problem that I've attempted to solve. Um, I passed the, I drafted the legislation that um, reset the mandate. So before it was 40% that was mandated for extremely and low income. So that's 30% and 50%. Um, we worked to change that to 50% to set the tone that making it clear statutorily that we want the majority, the overwhelming majority to be spent in that level. But that's still not producing, producing the results that we need. So I believe that we need to have more transparency. So one legislative idea is that the applications for the HPTF should be made public. Um, the decisions, we can create a mechanism for those decision makings, to the rationales to be explicit and made public in real time. I believe that we should have quarterly hearings on the housing production trust fund specifically. Um, just having once, of a year, once a year hearing during performance oversight season is not enough. And then it's about the, the backdoor oversight, the letters that you're sending, the oversight that's going on with the around between the director and council members behind closed doors. As someone that's worked at the council, I understand how that's done. So I would improve oversight in all three mechanisms. Excellent. Well, I think uh, very similar to these issues, uh, but still distinct from them um, are uh, the, let's say, uh, issues over at the DC Housing Authority. Um, I'm curious uh, what you all think of the job that uh, the new-ish executive director, Brenda Donald, has done. Um, you know, she just got a two-year contract, uh, but uh, I understand that that'll be up for renewal next year. Um, so this is a question both about her leadership and the overall direction of the Housing Authority. What's your opinion of it? Do you think that she deserves to, to have the chance uh, to continue leading the Housing Authority? Um, Nate, we will start with you on this. So... To be honest, um, I haven't been focused on the details of Brenda Donald's term at the Housing Authority. Um, I've been focused on this campaign. But what I'll tell you is that Brenda Donald's has served in almost every um, executive position that we have um, throughout the DC government. And she has a good relationship with the mayor. So I believe the idea, the DC Housing Authority is, is technically an independent agency. So I think the idea is to have someone that has a close relationship or a trusted relationship with the mayor in that position. Um, but I believe generally that that becomes problematic. That's how we have some of the issues that we have at the um, DCHD. So I would say generally, I, I would pro probably say I don't approve of what's going on, but I haven't um, looked in what's detailed. But I'll say that we generally have a problem with appointing people to these positions without rigorous oversight. And, then, and particularly in independent agencies like DC. HA is very important that the people that we appoint, such as Tyrone Garrett, and the people that we appoint to the board um, are people that um, are vetted rigorously. Well, how about this? Uh, since uh, you haven't been focused on Ms. Donald's tenure specifically, I'll ask you a little bit about the funding uh, for DCHA, which would very much be in your purview if you made it onto the council. They've 
steadily increased funding for public housing repairs the last few years. But of course, we know that the need for maintenance is in the billions. Uh, I'm curious uh, if you think that there is more the council could be doing. They're doing about the right amount. Uh, how do you see it? I think there's always more that the council can be doing. As an advocate, I advocated um, beginning in you know 2013, 2014 for um, more um, local dollars spent on public housing repairs. Uh, as a council staffer, the times that we've um, used um, some of our dollars during the budget season for that purpose, I've been an advocate for that. I think what we need to do is think about ways to um, dedicate revenue to that purpose. I believe, as I stated, that the government, local government needs to be a developer of housing. Um, that's what's going on. Um, Vienna, Austria is the leader in the model called social housing because for long, for so long, the purview of public housing has been in the federal government. And that's why we have um, the gaps that we have now. So the local government has to take a role in being a developer. And that's not just of um, extremely low income housing, but both a moderate income housing, workforce housing, housing for government workers. So I think overall, more local investment in public housing is definitely needed and we should dedicate revenue for the purpose. Excellent. Well, Lisa, let's get you in on this question. Tell me about what you think of Brenda Donald's tenure at, at DCHA and the direction of the agency overall. Um, I think I'll answer this from a perspective, not necessarily with Brenda Donaldson's tenure, but um, I will bring into this my uh, career background, which has been 20 some years at the IG's office of HUD, overseeing public housing agencies and other housing programs. And I'm definitely concerned, obviously, with the direction of DCHA in general, regardless of its leadership. I think we have to look at it kind of from a holistic perspective and a long-term perspective. DC Housing Authority has always had major issues. Um, can she fix this? That's what I'm looking at. Can she, can she have the appropriate leadership to change the Housing Authority around? I'm not so sure. Um, I am really interested in the uh, HUD audit that is going on. I believe the recovery team is in there possibly at this moment in time. I think that is going to give us the most solid picture of where we are with the housing authority and what as a city and particularly as a council that we need to do to get them back on track. Yeah, I'll follow up by asking a similar question to the one I asked Nate, um, but, but you know, maybe asking you to consider it this way. You know, funding is certainly an issue for them based on what they've told the council about their maintenance needs. But as you identify, there are governance issues as well that HUD and others, you know, have, have wanted to take a look at. Uh, what do you think that is the most important need for them that council could address? Mm. I do think funding is an, a very important need. Um, I believe the mayor has asked for about 37 million or so in this current budget for the housing authority uh, for repairs. Uh, and I believe, I don't wanna get this wrong, over a three year time frame or so, um, I would like to see them uh, bump that funding up. The council, I would say at least 60 million. And I would bump that over years, possibly as high as 10 years. Uh, we have definitely a deteriorating housing stock, and we're going to have to all, you know, get in line with giving them the afford the housing or the money that they need um, to get to some of these repairs and get that housing stock back in shape. That's going to be really critical for those lower income levels um, that are going to be at risk um, for being displaced or just not having housing. Public housing is really critical in DC, and I think we're going to have to just settle on making that investment. But the oversight, once we make that investment, is going to be extremely critical. <laughs> I heard you. I heard you. <laughs> well, thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, I, I wanted to move now to ask a little bit about um, downtown and specifically housing downtown. I think that most people uh, in, in the wake of the pandemic can uh, appreciate that there's perhaps a need for a better mix of uses downtown, specifically when it comes to adding housing. And now the question is kind of how the council uh, can go about making that a reality. Uh, I'm curious if you think the city should be in the business of subsidizing, um, you know, perhaps office conversions, um, even though that process.
expensive and difficult as, as developers always seem to say it is when I talk to them. So uh, I think, uh, Lisa, we're going to start with you first this time. Yeah. I definitely think we should be um, in the vi- in the business of subsidizing um, housing conversions, office conversions, building conversions in downtown. We have to be as creative as possible and use as many tools as we can in terms of developing affordable housing in the city. Um, we're coming out of the pandemic. We have a tremendous amount of vacant office space in the downtown area. Um, It is a perfect location to add different uh, levels of housing, including affordable housing. It's close to transit. It's close to museums. It's close to businesses. And by doing that, um, you, you know, definitely can also revitalize some of the downtown areas which need revitalization. So I'm definitely supportive of that. Um, You know, revital or rehabbing, I think, is a little probably cheaper than doing new construction. So it's something that we're not used to, but I think it's something that we, we have to consider to try to meet our goals. Yeah, absolutely. Nate, uh, same question goes to you. Uh, the, the question essentially being, you know, how do we uh, ensure that there is more housing downtown and how much of a city subsidy would you be willing to explore to make that happen? Okay, well, I, I definitely think that we should be making more investments in. Um, making sure that there's housing opportunities downtown, as you stated. Um, the pandemic, there's been so many systems that weren't working for Washingtonians before the pandemic, and the pandemic has exacerbated them. And housing is one of those things. So we have an opportunity, for lack of a better term, to um, re-envision and to build back better. And I think this is an area where we can do so. i like to give kudos to Robert White. Um, he ran on this when he first ran in 2016, and it, it seems like his vision was timely and prescient. But not only should we look at uh, ways to convert downtown, we need to look in other ways across the city to do what they did in Vancouver, which is the concept of invisible or or hidden density. Finding areas to increase density, of course, we want to increase density around transit and in corridors, but there's also areas like downtown, including making it easier for people to create ADUs in the um, personal properties that they have. We need to, like I said, use as many tactics as possible to address the housing needs of the district because they're so numerous. Um, to, to follow up on that question, something that I'll, I'll ask both of you is, you know, we discussed the possibility of a subsidy, but plenty of developers have told me as well that you know, hey, maybe even a tax abatement isn't enough. Maybe it takes something like an exemption from inclusionary zoning requirements, these other tools that the city can deploy. Of course, the double-edged sword of that is, you know, you you still want housing to be affordable uh, with every product that you get, uh, but plenty of developers will tell you that's simply not possible. Uh, Nate, I'm curious how how you think about that question. Are, Are there other exemptions you'd be willing to allow if it meant there was more housing downtown? Um, so I believe there's large areas of downtown that are exempt already from inclusionary zoning. Um, and so I believe that we should be thinking about removing those exemptions. So I don't think that can be a good incentive in that in those particular areas. But I do, um, I've had experience, particularly on the Reunion Square project on Martin Luther King Avenue, which is the first tax incremented funding project in Ward 8, um, negotiating with developers. And I think we need to have stronger clawbacks. One thing that I would do is um, implement a clawback regime similar to what they have in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, that makes sure that a lot of the things that we um, are promised in return for some of these tax abatements or incentives from the government, if we don't receive those things, uh, we can claw back and, and get some of our resources back. I think that's important for holding developers accountable because they're gonna always say that they need more, but when they do make these um, promises to the district, we need to make sure that we're getting the return on our investment. We have countless examples of what we have. Thanks, Nate. Uh, same question to you, Lisa. Uh, moving beyond subsidy, are there changes you would uh, consider uh, if it makes uh, housing downtown more possible? Um, definitely. Now, on the mention of um, exempt and ID, I don't know if I would uh, be favorable of that. Uh, that would be something that I would have to really thoughtfully consider. Um, I am definitely 
uh, pro affordable housing, getting as much in there as we can, but I'm also very highly considerate of the human condition in terms of affordable housing and making sure that we have a mix of affordability levels in there. Um, I do believe developers are going to say they're obviously going to need more to do more, uh, but we have to make sure that we have the best interests of our citizens in mind and that we get what we need for our residents to make sure that they thrive in those areas and that they have the same opportunities as uh, you know other higher income residents as well. So I would just be really cautious to make sure that we're balancing those two needs. Doubtless uh, uh, the uh, community to negotiate for a project that reflects some sort of neighborhood consensus, but of course, uh, they have often led to extensive and costly litigation over these last few years. Uh, Alex, we may have lost you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, now we can. <laughs> Get cut off. Uh, I'm curious what you all think you could do uh, on the council to make the PUD process work again, um, especially, um, you know, whether that requires, uh, you know, PAM or, or something else entirely. Uh, Nate, I think think you are up first. Okay, well, this is an issue that um, I've dealt with um, working on the amendments to the comprehensive plan, working with um, Greater Greater Washington, which were key stakeholders um, as it relates to that. I think there's some things, one of the things that I think we need to do is standardize the community benefits agreement process. Um, I think there's models out there in other jurisdictions where we can make sure that the community isn't out leveraged by developers right now. Um, in these agreements, the developers, they have lawyers, they have resources, and ANC commissioners are essentially negotiating with them. And oftentimes their interests aren't aligned with the community. So I think standardizing that process is one way that we can um, strengthen the process. At the same time, I believe that we need to have strong clawbacks, standardizing the clawback process. So when they make promises um, in, in return for some of these incentives as it relates to um, zoning, then we need to hold them accountable for um, standing up to them. So I think we need to do both things, um, standardize the CBA process and also um, standardize the clawback process. Thanks, Nate. Same question to you, Lisa. If you could uh, do something to improve the PUD process, what would it be? Um, I think it would definitely, Alex, be uh, very similar in terms of the community benefit agreement process and making sure that communities are fully aware of their benefits within that or in how to negotiate and navigate that process. And um, I'm gonna give you know Nate uh, credit on this one in terms of uh, saying that the clawback issue is a big deal with communities. So I wholeheartedly agree. I think those are the two most important issues when it comes to PUDs, making sure that our neighbors are engaged, that they understand that process and when developers promise issues in the CBA process that they actually come to fruition. Um, it is tough on ANC commissioners. They uh, go through these issues as well and struggle through it as well. I would love to see support for the ANC, Office of Attorney General, um, Office of Planning or someone to kind of help the ANCs out when they're going through this issue as well. That's what I would focus on. Um, can I actually ask a follow-up question, <laughs> since this is something of a hobby horse for me? You know, there's 26 community benefits in, in the PUD process that can be picked from, and they, they range from affordable housing, uh, indeterminate amount, to tree boxes, to streetscape improvements, to like sometimes contributions to nearby organi community organizations. I is, does this make sense? Like, is that a good thing? Is that too much? What is the right balance to strike 
with community benefits um, when we have, we actually have quite a long list. In other cities, those are not navigated actually even more subjectively, like that there actually is no list that often leads to some level of corruption. <laughs> and, yeah. um, you know, so so what what is the right, like, I hear you on communities having input and developers should not withdraw stuff from them, but like, what is the right thing to do here to both like achieve goals, which are often more broad based than what any given ANC may often want. And also like stick the landing on stuff that developers are often like, I don't care about boxes. <laughs> um, I mean, I'll, Lisa, I'll give you a minute then turn it over to Nate. I just think Alex is dependent on the community. I mean, I, I really think it depends on the community need. I don't know all the 26 agreement or uh, CBA categories, but I do think having a broad range that you can offer to communities when development occurs is a is a good benefit for them to to pick and choose from. That's one less process that they have to learn that they have to try to figure out. Um, so, and I think that's going to be very different depending on what community you're in. Um, I'll use you know communities that are not as um, high opportunity. You know, Chevy Chase's. Uh, CBA agreement is going to look different than maybe a community east of the river. So I think that it's just going to be community dependent, but I do like having those CBA agreements or those categories outlined for communities, um, as well as some things that might not be in there that, you know, that communities really need to have access to. Cool. Thank you. Um, Nate, go ahead. So I think this is really important, and, and that's what I mean by reforming the CBA process. So I think one um, of the benefits of the list that we have, I think we should categorize them and prioritize them and tier them so that benefits that are most important um, receive um, you get greater benefit for including that in your proposal. So for example, often I've had examples of communities, their benefits are uniforms for the local um, school, elementary school basketball team. And that doesn't compare, like you just said, with, with the affordability of housing. Um, I think that's one thing that we need to do. And so by standardization, I mean that, for example, if we say affordability um, is something that we prioritize, then the local government should standardize the points that you would receive if you include a certain amount of affordability in your project, particularly in areas where the government has more leverage. So tax increment fin financing, um, projects that use housing production trust fund money. So I do think we should be tiering these um, benefits so that uh, we can prioritize the things that are most important to the city. But I also agree with Lisa in terms of more support for ANCs as well. Thank you. Well, thank you both. I'll turn it over to our regular moderator. <laughs> <laughs> uh, always appreciate chiming in from the other Alex. Uh, so let's take us in the direction of historic preservation. Um, another uh, very important uh, issue as we consider, you know, making development, uh, let's say, work in the city. And, you know, the, the questions that Greater Greater Washington asked you all on their questionnaire was about whether you'd like to remove height and mass, say, from the purview of historic preservation officials. But answer this question for me a little more broadly. Do you believe the city's preservation regime, as it's currently constructed now, makes sense, or is it too biased against new development? Uh, how would you change it uh, if you change it at all? Um, Lisa, we'll start with you on this. Wow, that is a great question. Um, I think there is definitely a role for historic preservation um, throughout all communities. We have, I believe, three historic Black communities that have historic preservation aspects to them. Um, so culturally, I believe it is, um, you know, something that we need to, to, um, to keep. Now, how would I amend it or change it? Um, I would just personally not like to see historic preservation weaponized to prevent affordable housing projects. Um, I know that's tough because communities have a right to engage in the historic preservation process. But I do think there is a, ro a rule or a role for historic preservation. Um, I think that height uh, should be included in that process as well. And um, I would probably just uh, just 
think about it from that aspect that we're not using it to present to prevent affordable housing projects. Yeah, so so tell me slightly more about that. Um, you know, you mentioned it not being weaponized. I'm sure we can all think of cases where it has been. Uh, perhaps as an A and C, you've seen that. Uh, is there a specific policy change? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, uh, is there a specific policy change you think that could make that difference? Since you want height and mass uh, to remain part of it. You know what, Alex? I'm not real. Um... I would really have to really thoughtfully consider that one. Um, I know right now that we are undergoing a small area plan in Chevy Chase along the Connecticut Avenue corridor. Um, one of the things our ANC has been pushing all along is affordable housing along that corridor and particularly with um, the Chevy Chase Community Center and the library. Um, we have historic preservation um, buildings in the area. So the arcade, Chevy Chase Arcade, um, the Chevy Chase Theater. And I know there is concern that residents have about the look of the avenue. But I also know that there are a lot of residents that want affordable housing along the avenue as well. Um, and just how do you mesh that? I'm not sure if I have the best answer for that. Um, because I do believe that is a community process. That's something that's a small area plan kind of allows us to look at. Um, and then, you know, we do have residents right now that want to go into the historic preservation realm. So I think that is like a, a larger community conversation that must be had. Fair enough. Well, Nate, same question to you. Um, you know, how is historic preservation uh, in the city working right now? And, and what, if anything, would you change about it? Well, I'd like to start with that. I grew up in a, a neighborhood that's um, designated historic, the historic Anacostia community. And I've done a lot of work in this community. And so I am familiar with the process. I am familiar and have grown to have a stronger appreciation uh, for the need to um, maintain the historic character of neighborhoods. Um, I do agree with um, Lisa. I would have used the exact same word in terms of, I do not believe it should be weaponized. And in terms of specific reforms, as you asked, um, the board right now, the historic, historic Preservation Board is a nine member board. And I believe two, no more than three of those members are citizen members. The rest are professional based members. So I think we should think about changing the character of that board. I think making it a larger board, adding more citizens to that board is something that we should think about. Also, I think there should be opportunity for people, um, more neighborhood expertise. So if there's um, a way to expand an advisory board as it relates to neighborhood uh, historic preservation, I think that can create more of a citizen voice in that role, uh, which will lead to, I think, um, things that are aligned with the citizen's interest being um, forwarded. Absolutely. Well, and let me ask you specifically about uh, height and mass, since I'm not sure if I heard you mention in there. Do you think that should remain under the purview of uh, historic preservation officials? Um, I think that's something that we should look at, um, whether that should remain in or not. I believe generally um, height is, a, you know, D.C., one of the reasons that we're um, a less dense city than, than the most cities of our size or of our character is because of um, height restrictions. So I think generally speaking, we, we need to take a look at whether those um, the, the statutory framework that we have in relates to height um, benefits the district as it relates to our housing goals in 2022. So across the board, I think we should be looking at height. Absolutely. So this question is a simple one um, in terms of its formulation, but uh, certainly a complex one for you to answer. As council member, uh, how are you going to ensure that subsidized affordable housing is built across the district in every part of the district? And, you know, we're, we're not going to tell you how to answer, but, you know, if it's simply more oversight, well, you know, we, we've heard that one before. So give me give me some ideas. I'm, I'm uh, anxious to hear. Uh, Nate, we'll start with you. Well, I think we have to be as a community more clear um, and transparent and open um, and public about our goals and the need for everyone in all neighborhoods to, to participate. There needs to be stronger marketing, um, stronger leadership to make sure the residents know that this is a goal. Because the problem that we have is that people agree with affordable housing generally, but uh, in too many communities, people don't agree with it specifically. And when we have things like the mayor's um, goals to increase the percentage of affordable housing in areas that have had um, 
very little affordable housing, we get a lot of pushback. I hear this when I knock on doors in some of these communities. So we have to do the hard work of making sure that citizens buy in. And, and I think often that includes making sure that citizens have the opportunity to participate, but also making sure that citizens are informed of the need for um, affordable housing to be um, distributed throughout the district. I think that's very important. All right, well, Lisa, same, same question goes to you. How are you gonna fight for uh, subsidized affordable housing uh, throughout DC? Um, you know, I think it definitely is a fight. And I think, um, you know, one of the first things is looking at that place-based strategy and the, the different targeted goals. I, I really think also that the council has to get serious. I think once the community sees affordable housing actually being developed, regardless of the methodology, housing production trust fund dollars, community land trust, social housing, um, there's all kinds of, you know, mechanisms that we could use to do that. But we have to, I think our community has to see that it is a community effort. Right now, you guys know, Rock Creek West has the least amount of affordable housing, what, 1%? And we are like the least to build affordable housing. So I, I think it has to be um, a strategy that is place-based, that where we meet our goals, but I think we have to get serious about placing affordable housing in all areas of the city. And I think that will go a long way um, with members of the community who have to buy into this. We, we have to find common ground and we uh, have to do that from a leadership level. Thank you. Sorry, um, Alan. Oh, it's okay. Um, I actually have a follow-up for, for you based on that question, but I want you both to answer it. When people see construction, they freak out, right? Regardless of what, regardless of what it is. And, and so I, I, I very strongly like hear your statement about like people need to see this built because I, I actually say that all the time. Yeah. Um, but seeing things built is often what creates a bit of a reactionary presence. So how do you, can both of you, and you know, Lisa, you can go first, but can both of you speak to how to break that wheel of seeing new construction, having to deal with new construction and new construction is annoying, right? Like, um, but it lasts for 18 months about, and then it's done. And so, you know, and sometimes, you know, I, I've seen people who say, oh, that building is for gentrifiers and it's like a 100% affordable project. So how do you break that like dynamic so that we can actually show that we're delivering on that? What would you do to actually do that? You know, I think Alex, from, you know, my perspective and what, you know, talking to folks in my ANC, talking to people just on a campaign trail throughout the city, there's a feeling in the city that development or DC has been sold out to development for the lowest bid. And, I, and when I say get serious about what we're actually building, people have to see that we're building for the common good. And I think that will alleviate a lot of that development fear. I really believe, you know, people don't necessarily like change in their neighborhood, but there are a lot of folks out there that are willing to sacrifice and have change in their neighborhood if they believe it's meeting that goal, if that if it's meeting that affordable housing goal, but a lot of times what we're still seeing are market rate projects that are going up with very minimal affordable housing in those projects. So that creates that that fear and distrust in the community. So I think once we really start investing heavily in those deeply affordable levels, I think that will open up a groundswell of support from our community members and make it much easier for us to advocate for that. Thank you. Um, Nate, do you wanna go ahead? Well, that's part of why my answer to the original question was leadership, more transparency, getting more community buy-in. It sounded like, you know, kind of a fluffy answer to the question, but that's really what ne what's needed. Like you said, people are informed. So when something comes up, there's not the neighborhood consensus around it. And it's important to build that. We need more transparency. We need more community participation. We need a stronger dashboard so people can understand what's going on and their role to play with it. I think that we need to create stronger incentives. Um, so if in certain areas, if you produce affordable housing, we should give you more incentives to incentivize um, affordability west of the park. But also we need to use more city-used land, um, use tools like DOPA and community land trusts 
where there's a um, there's less of a role for the community to usurp um, the ability of affordable housing. If we're using more city owned land, there's less of the zoning and some of those areas where things can get um, sidetracked. So we really need to be focusing and that's where social housing comes into play because mixed use, uh, moderate ha um, housing, if I could just have five more seconds, um, alleviate some of those fears. Um, and I think that in total, all those things working together will lead to um, the development of more subsidized housing across the city. Cool, I appreciate that. I mean, it'd be really annoying to ask another follow-up question because um, I like, Juju Ash talks about a lot about land acquisition, about the district developing more housing. You know, Nate, you sort of brought up the, the general social housing kind of like plan is government owned, it is mixed income, but it's also subsidized across incomes. Um, Lisa, I totally hear you on needing to build more, you know, we talked about this sort of at the top of this, more deeply, deeply affordable units. Um, but a lot of people, you know, in our neighborhoods are not, like are, are in this like middle bracket that's not zero to 30 and not 30 to 50, but they're like, they're at 60 to 80 and 80 to 120. And Gigi Wash has actually in the past disagreed with subsidizing things at, you know, in that 60 to 120 range, sort of saying that the market should build it, developers should build it so that we don't lose our limited subsidies because we don't have a lot. Um, and so how, how would you square that? How, you know, I'm, you know, on one hand, if we subsidize things more broadly, we get more, you know, public support for it, which is why I think, you know, you look at Vienna, you look at Singapore that have these, you look at Germany that have sort of robust, wide ranging subsidies for all income levels, but then this is the US and we are, you know, if we do subsidize at the lower end, we can't subsidize the middle class, but then the middle class is sort of rightfully angry with developers because rich people live in those units, but they also live in market rate housing. So I threw a lot at you and that was more of a comment than a question, which is like totally rude. Um, but Nate, do you wanna go ahead and tackle that? And then I'll turn it over to Lisa. You're muted. You're muted. Hold on. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> once again, I think it's important that the government plays a large role in that 60 to 120 space. Because often I remember running for this office and saying, you know, well, housing's an area where the government can't control everything. You know, the market plays out. But that's not true. The government is the largest, most important player in the market. So we need to do things to leverage the market, the supply and demand uh, equation in areas, for example, like RFK, where we have um, land that can be transferred to the city. We need to make sure that we're doing as much as we can on those sites because that's going to leverage the market in our favor. Um, and I think, once again, the reason why we don't have social housing, which is a viable answer to these problems, is simply because the federal government has played the ro large role in public housing historically. So that's preempted local governments from taking a role. And since the federal government wants to divest, that means the local governments have an opportunity. And that's particularly in that space. I also believe in live, work, play communities for government workers, teachers, um, and, and up firefighters, et cetera. And I think those are kind of the areas we can build consensus for building affordability, um, government-based affordability at those levels. Thank you. Um, big answer to a big question. I appreciate it. Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Yep. Um, so I do also believe, I mean, you know, the government, so with even just with HUD, so we have programs that uh, target that 60 to 120% AMI already. So we're already in that subsidy market. Um, these are like our teachers, our law enforcement, you know, kind of our missing middle folks, um, the folks that are government workers. So I think we have to play a role when it comes to subsidizing this level of affordability. Um, but Alex, just like you said, it is a huge trade-off. And how do you make that trade-off? I think we had kind of a questionnaire that asked us to make that trade off, you know, in and of itself. Um, I, I think it is an opportunity. Um, we have to, as I said, uh, I think just come to the realization that we're gonna have to fund housing a lot more than we've done it before. Um, and how we do that, that's, that's the question. But I do believe we, we have to pay attention to this uh, level of affordability. 
Thank you. Um, okay, I, I'm out, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's your debate. You get to do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. We, I like we, this is this is Greater Greater Washington. So obviously uh, we got to talk transportation uh, as well as housing. So let's get into it. Um, I, I think that uh, if you've been on any forum or campaign uh, appearance um, over the last few years, really, but especially this year, just about everybody uh, can agree that Vision Zero has, to put it lightly, not lived up to expectations, maybe even been an outright failure. Um, so I'm curious what you two would do to reverse that trend and uh, make it a reality. And in your answer, I, I think it would be helpful too if you made it clear you were talking about Mayor Bowser's Vision Zero, simply the idea that no one should die in um, a uh, uh, wreck, um, or uh, the council legislation uh, known as Vision Zero, to make sure we know what you're talking about, because I know these can be conflated. So, Nate, I'll start with you on that question. Okay. Well, um, I think Vision Zero um, is aspirational. So, I don't want to, it has not met expectation but we have to move towards our aspiration. And that's what this process is about, resetting, figuring out what we can do better. I think a room for tremendous improvement is east of the river. I'd like to thank Greater Greater Washington for taking a focus on transportation issues east of the river, given that there's more deaths over on this side of town and looking at tra transportation through an equity lens, I think is something that's very important to building more consensus. I think um, I have a good, um, a, not, I wouldn't say a good friend, but an advocate by the name of Rudy Reed, who's really important as it relates to bicycle safety. And I gave him a suggestion. I think we should be incorporating things like when people renew their licenses, they should, we can go online and they can do a quick module on um, learning how to um, deal with bikers and biking regula regulations. I think those are the type of things that we need to do to be more inclusive and to make sure that we stop pedestrian deaths also think we need more human enforcement of traffic um, laws, and that doesn't necessarily have to be the police. We can create, um, have other entities do that enforcement, but we need to rely on human and um, automated enforcement to, um, I think, achieve the goals. Well, it sounded like, Nate, you, you were uh, uh, running out of time there. So I, I'll ask you a, a follow-up um, that, that touches on this. You know, some of those uh, changes you outlined, you described, uh, sounds like many things that there are sort of housed within the executive and, uh, you know, the, the mayor has stated a commitment to Vision Zero and, and you know, there's mixed reviews on whether or not uh, that's actually happened. I'm curious how much you think necessarily you could do to sort of spur these changes within agencies versus, uh, you know, working collaboratively with the mayor. Like, how, how do you achieve some of the things you've outlined? Well, I, I think you have to do both. Um, things like human, um, increasing human enforcement things like um, ensuring that um, we can um, make sure the residents have opportunity to get re-educated because the rules of the road are changing and evolving. Those are things that can be legislated. I think you um, have to give the mayor some credit. I mean, um, changing the um, standard speed limit in the city from 25 to 20 is a big change. I think they did a good job in, in investing in that. Um, you see that er everywhere. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when we do transportation policy, sometimes um, in many communities, we lose trust because some people think that it's a money generating aspect. So we need to kind of remove that aspect and let people know it's about safety. It's about equity. And I think that there's things we can do. San Francisco has a financial justice project. I think we need to look at something like that so that we can make sure that we're doing all of this with an equity lens. Um, I think that can build more su supporting consensus. Fair enough. Uh, Lisa, same question to you. How do you make uh, Vision Zero a reality? Um, you know, I think there is a lot of consensus for Vision Zero. I don't, I don't think there's any resident uh, within DC that's um, accepting of the, you know, traffic deaths that we've seen, both, both pedestrian, bicyclists. Um, I, I think there has to, at some point, um, be a way that we implement Vision Zero more effectively. I know as an ANC commissioner, working with DDOT can sometimes be difficult. There's communities that have con consistently raised safety issues with DDOT, whether it's bad uh, crosswalks. Um, we just recently had legislation from the council on safe routes to school. 
um, bicycle lanes. There's, you know, a lot of delays in some of these implementations um, that we have of projects that will make roads and areas safer. So I think we might have a framework there, um, but I do think we have an implementation issue. Um, and just, you know, I go back to that in community, that community engagement piece, particularly DDOT working with communities to get some of these issues fixed and definitely the equity piece. I mean, it's not fairly implemented or You're designed, fine. you know, across the uh, different parts of the community. Are oh, you on time? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. okay. Well, you'll you'll be glad because our next question, I think, is going to address a lot of what you were talking about when it comes to DDOT um, and DPW as well, both agencies that people have spoken about as needing better oversight, needing, you know, uh, a more effective relationship uh, with the council um, and ANCs uh, to get things done. So I guess I'm curious, you know, how you would approach that question from a council perch. How do you make these critical agencies on transportation actually work uh, for people? Uh, Lisa, uh, we'll start with you. Wow. I mean, Alex, this is one after my heart <laughs> because as an ANC, um, a lot of my time has been spent work trying to work with DDOT. DDOT has great staff. Um, let me just say that um, there are people that I can call in DDOT who have helped me fix not only things here in my ward, but also, you know, wards east of the river. But there has to be, I think, from um, an executive leadership perspective and understanding that we have to work with the community. The community is a lot of times accepting of some of these changes, um, speed humps. Uh, street improvement, but they have to be involved. Sometimes it's just a little courtesy. So as a council member, we have to demand that of our executives, regardless of what they're with DDOT or any other agency, we have to demand that they respect the community and um, that they work effectively with the community. I see I ran out of time. I had some other stuff, but <laughs> well, Nate, the same the name same question goes to you. How do you improve oversight of DDOT, DPW, and and make sure that they work uh, effectively with the council and and with the uh, regular folks? Thanks for the question. Um, so I've I've knocked a lot of doors in this campaign, and I started knocking doors in Ward Seven. I've been knocking doors throughout the city, and when I ask people what's important to them, traffic safety comes up much more than I expected it to. Uh, and as a result, I've had to talk more about it and, and think um, much more about it. And one of the things that I say is that we need increased transparency around the process for um, working with DDOT. So for example, I think that we need a website that makes it easier and more transparent to make road, um, I mean, speed bump requests, other traffic calming um, requests, because often, like Lisa said, people are not aware of that a request has been made. Or there's sometimes reason why DDOT cannot um, accommodate a request, but the community doesn't know that. So they think DDOT isn't thinking about it at all. So I think that, that we need to make a one-stop shop for requesting um, calming measures and tracking the status of calming measures because that gives the community a role to play. Also think that we need to have community advisory boards in each ward that works with those agencies um, because the tra transportation, those issues are issues that communities on the ground have the most expertise and we need to find a way to um, have their input um, be taken more seriously. Thanks, Nate. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask a little bit now about uh, parking, uh, considering that parking spaces take up, uh, you know, a huge amount of uh, land in, in highly desired and utilized areas of the district. So I guess I'm curious how you would each view efforts to convert those spaces and lanes into areas for pedestrians, cyclists, or public-private uses? How would you view efforts to centralize parking um, into concentrated structures and spaces adjacent to public transit in order to, you know, reduce a little bit of the strain of, of vehicle dominance in the city? Um, Nate, uh, we will start with you. Well, I'm glad that you um, mentioned centralized parking um, because I think the lack of, um, I just think the influence of the parking lobby um, which has been um, evidenced through Jack Evans and his relationship with the parking lobby for years has a huge impact on um, our outcomes in the district. 
And I think that we're missing a lot of um, just low hanging fruit um, on this issue because we um, make policies at the mercy of the parking lobby. And that's something that I would change. That's something that um, has always been a personal issue to me. And it's something that I didn't understand until I you know, got a stronger understanding of how the DC government works. And I think that's a good example of why I'll be a good fit on the council because a lot of these issues, it's not my first time. Is I, I, I know about the issues, but I also know why we haven't made change. And I, um, I've been involved in trying to make change and I've been successful and I failed. And I think um, this is an area where there's a lot of room for growth, but we have to have leaders that have the um, understanding and the um, commitment to get things done. Great, well, same question goes to you, Lisa. Tell me about your approach to, to parking in the city and uh, you know how you feel about efforts to uh, reduce it, centralize it, maybe a little bit of both. I'm definitely in agreement with that. Um, you know, my platform in terms of transportation uh, points to the fact that DC is a heavily car centric uh, jurisdiction like most of our cities in the US. Uh, we have to go to a better transportation model. My platform also calls for a 15 minute city, which is a city where you can basically meet all your essential needs within a 15 minute walk, uh, bus ride or bicycle ride. So I would love to see us move to being less car centric. Um, and again, community engagement is going to be very critical in that process. Uh, we're looking at right now Connecticut Avenue bike lanes, uh, where we're going to reduce uh, uh, vehicle passage lanes along Connecticut Avenue in favor of a redesign that incorporates bike lanes. Um, I would love to see some of those parking lanes become uh, bus lanes as well. So I'm definitely in favor for that. Fantastic. Well, uh, this, this question, I think, will also start to address that, which is a, another simple one. You know, what do you feel is the most transformative project uh, in the budget that's either unfunded or underfunded uh, when it comes to transportation? I, I can see Nate's got his thinking cap on. Uh, Lisa, we'll start with you and see if you know. Wow. I'm going to say I'm going to be favorable to uh, the project that I fought so long and hard for Connecticut Avenue uh, bicycle lane. So I'm not sure what the funding level is, but um, I would love to see that fully funded. That's one of the things that we, you know, when we talked in a previous question, just about Vision Zero and making our streets safer, funding is critical. I mean, they've been looking at that Connecticut Avenue redesigned for years that didn't just start. So we need to get that fully funded and get it underway, get it developed and get it done. Fantastic. Well, Nate, same question goes to you. What's that number one project you wish could get funded or, or can get a little more funding transportation wise? I think number one would be the extension of the streetcar to Benning Road, um, just for how symbolic it is, um, how transformative it can be in terms of connecting residents um, to the entire city. The fact that the streetcar was a very ambitious project that hasn't met expectations. So I think in terms of making future investments, it's important to meet um, the citizens' expectations. So I would say that would be number one. Number two, we need to make some, um, I think Southern Avenue in, in Ward 8 is a, um, a great example of a, a, a road that needs a lot of help. We've had a lot of evidence and we've had a lot of depths, but we haven't had the investment and in, 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 in the calming measures that we need. I would say that is number two. And there's other examples of streets just like that. So that would be my number two. And then number three, I would say the K Street project, just because of its scope um, and um, what it means. K Street is a very prestigious street. So making those changes on K Street will have a, um, I think will have a uh, effect throughout um, our city and how we approach transportation. Absolutely. You know, this is another question that might sound simple, uh, but with this uh, complex answer, I suspect, how would you slow down drivers uh, if you were on the council? What's the number one thing that the city can do uh, to, to get people to slow down? Nate, we'll start with you. Re-education. I don't think we think about that enough. We have opportunities every time that um, a resident renews their license, we have an opportunity to educate drivers again. Um, we educate drivers one time when they're 16 or 17 and rely on that 
for the um, the rest of their lives, even though times change, even though attitudes change, even though the city's needs change. So we need to um, increase education. Once again, another thing that I talk about often when I talk to voters about this issue is the need for human enforcement. Um, I think some of the um, most um, notorious offenders have don't they they they're not going to pay the tickets anyway. So they've already priced in um, the fact that they're not going to comply. And that leads to increased danger. So we have more human enforcement, particularly uh, we know the intersections that are most deadly. We know that we need to have more enforcement around schools and areas where children's are. So I think we should have more human enforcement. And like I said, that does not necessarily need to be the uh, Metropolitan Police Department. But I think in, in concert, those things can make drivers slow down. I, I didn't hear you mention street design or traffic calming measures in there. Is, is that a, a intentional or you're just running out of time? Do you see a role for street design and, and calming measures uh, uh, to slow folks down? Certainly I do. Um, and yeah, definitely a function of the lack of time. Like I said, I want to make a, a create a more transparent process for requesting traffic calming measures so people can understand what requests are being made. Um, and understand the decision making on those requests and so that the community can play a larger role in, in traffic calming. I believe that we should be scoring our neighborhoods based upon their walkability. And so that's a, a big function of walkability, um, traffic calming measures, making sure that we have protected lanes and things of that nature to make sure that neighborhoods are more walkable. Um, I think DC has been a leader in making sure that we have some conception of walkability and how we make development decisions. We're one of the first cities to do that. But we're the first city to do a lot of things. It doesn't mean that we do them well. And this is an example of an area that we can um, certainly improve on, even though we have been a leader in implementing walkability into some of our development decisions. Great. Well, same question goes to you, Lisa. How would you slow drivers down? What's it going to take? I, well, I think um, you know street design is probably the number one uh, way for us to, to look at this and to slow that traffic down. I'll take, for example, um, Chestnut Street, which was a big project here in my ANC. I was a commissioner um, when this project was implemented. Uh, it was also very controversial because it was part of Beach Drive closure. Um, but the redesign of that street absolutely slowed traffic down. So I think that's our number one thing. Um, we have gone to uh, reduce the speed limit. So I think that is a, a, a thing that we have to continually enforce and enforcement reciprocity with surrounding jurisdictions to see if there's some type of um, avenue to hold drivers that are outside of our jurisdiction accountable for speeding. I know as a resident in my neighborhood and also as a commissioner that stood on that block most of our speeders were absolutely out of state plates. So that's something we have got to tackle. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, uh, being a council member these days involves a lot of Zoom hearings like this one, but I imagine uh, as, as things uh, start to maybe someday return to normal, it'll involve going to the Wilson building, commuting uh, as, as everyone is used to. So uh, tell me if, if you guys are uh, lucky enough to win, how are you going to get to work? Lisa, tell me all about it. Oh, I would love to. So I live right at the corner of uh, Western and Oregon, and uh, I could take the M4, catch it up to uh, Tinley Town, and get to the Wilson Building that way. I would also like to add that I could probably get to the Wilson Building faster if they brought back our E6 bus route that would take me straight to um, the uh, Friendship Heights Metro Station. So probably a combination of Metro. Um, I'm sure some days I would be in a car as well, but um, there's a lot of you know places that I can get to, especially in this area with good bus transportation and just connecting directly to our red line Metro. Fantastic. Well, the same question goes to you, Nate. Uh, if you're commuting uh, to the Wilson building once more, what's that gonna look like for you? I think I'll be taking um, a mixed method approach. Um, one thing that I will say, I, I do uh, think that I would take from Charles Allen's approach. Charles Allen takes Metro um, to work um, as much as possible. Actually, I, I've, I've met him several times, you know, on, on the bus um, as we both have gone to the Wilson building. And I think when you do things like that, you're able to um, learn 
And that's why I would take a variety of methods. Um, I like when there's been um, council members that have um, taken the same route as students to school and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so I believe that creating different methods of transportation creates opportunities from you to um, learn from the lived experience of others. And I think as a council member, it's as important as possible to have as many perspectives um, to inform your decision-making as possible. And I think um, transportation is one viable way of doing it. Fantastic. Well, we're gonna uh, move now to some of our last questions of the night. Um, I believe uh, for this one, we're gonna give you uh, just 30 seconds to answer. So try and be succinct if, if you can. You know, we don't really expect uh, everyone here to necessarily be focused on exactly the same issues as uh, Greater Greater Washington, as, as thrilling as that might be for the, the other Alex here. But tell me, you know, what is your number one interest and number one priority uh, if you were to be elected uh, to the council? And, and like I said, uh, try and do so uh, as succinctly as you can. Um, I'll give Alex a moment to prepare for that. Uh, okay. It's just more time for you to really ponder, okay, come up with a good one this. here. Um, great. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Nate, we will start with you. As a public leader, I think the biggest long-term issue that DC faces is improving youth and young adult outcomes, particularly for youth that are educated in our public schools. And I think that requires expanding educational opportunity, economic opportunity, and housing opportunity. A lack of housing security in our city has a huge family um, role on family well-being, and so I believe that we should be addressing these issues comprehensively. And it's really important to my heart, having grown up in this city, um, had some success through education, and also just my experience um, being a victim of violent crime by young people in the city. Wonderful, Lisa. Same question. What's your top priority? Um, my top priority and the reason why I jumped into this race is housing. I've spent the last twenty plus years of my professional career working for the IG's Office of Housing and Urban Development and having oversight of federal housing programs and agencies across the United States, including here in Washington, D.C. Housing is the foundation of everything we need to make sure that our families, our kids particularly thrive, and it's something that we have to critically invest in in this city, and I'm a, I believe I'm the right candidate with the right experience to do that. Um, well, you guys are so confident that I couldn't even text Alex fast enough to tell him to reshuffle things a bit because the follow-up question to that was going to be explain the link to housing. Um, and you both nailed that and I appreciate it very much. Um, but why don't you take, you know, again, like 30 seconds to sort of say how each of those top priorities links to transportation. Um, Lisa, if you want to go ahead. Yeah. So uh, transportation links directly to housing because it, it, it basically is where we should be able to, from home, homeowner perspective, from a resident perspective, be able to navigate our city. So when we're close to transportation, we have more opportunities. We're able to get to places more rapidly and faster. And um, we're, our communities are not as isolated. When we have communities that don't have good transportation, that affects housing, jobs, and everything else around them. So transportation is directly linked to housing quality. Thank you. Nate, go ahead. Well, I agree with Lisa's answer. I think she hit it spot on. Um, transportation is an equity issue. So areas with worse transportation options are more likely to be food deserts. We have issues in terms of safe pathways to school, balance of of young people as it relates to school, that's connecting transportation to improving youth and young adult outcomes. And finally, uh, Metro is, I mean, really the heartbeat of the district. There's so much um, that Metro characterizes, including the opportunity for transit-oriented development. So I believe all those issues work to improving youth and young adult outcomes in DC. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much to you both. I, I think we've finally come to the part of the evening uh, where we get you out of here. But before we do, wanted to give you uh, both a chance uh, to, to close things up for us. So uh, Lisa, uh, start things off. Uh, uh, Alex, uh, Nick, our timer, but we'll trust you to have some good sense about timing. And in about 30 seconds or so, uh, what do you want to leave our audience with tonight? Um, I just want to thank Greater Greater Washington and all the partnering organizations for this forum and for hosting the at-large candidates, um, for the candidates that showed up to really talk about how critically important these issues are to Washington, D.C. 
housing in general, my platform stands for housing for all. So that's affordable housing, deeply affordable housing, um, safe, decent housing is critically important. And I uh, thank the audience members for listening. You can learn more about my housing platform at gorefordc.com. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues. Thank you, Lisa. Nate, uh, close us out. The same, I'd like to thank Alex, uh, both Alexes for your help on this um, and um, everyone that had something to do with this. Um, I believe we're at a critical moment in the district. As I said before, there were systems that weren't working for thousands of Washingtonians, um, including our housing system before the pandemic. And the pandemic has only exacerbated that. Um, I like to make it clear that I've done work on these issues. I've, I've accomplished results. I've drafted the language that banned evictions during the pandemic. I secured um, the funding for two million for the community land trust. I wrote the community land trust legislation. I wrote legislation around the housing production trust fund, worked to get anti-displacement language put into the um, comprehensive plan. So I appreciate Greater Greater Washington for bringing attention to these issues because that attention is what's necessary to bring consensus that's important to making sure that we progress on these issues. Um, these issues are difficult. These issues don't have easy answers. That's why we need council members that are commitment, committed, council members that are thoughtful, council members that are experienced, council members that are compassionate as it relates to these issues. And I believe that I can be that council member. Um, I look forward to continuing to work with you as we work to create a city that works for everybody, um, a city that's just, a city that does not lead um, the nation in terms of displacement of black residents, a city that doesn't have the highest, um, um, the most least affordable rental market in the country. Those are the type of hard things that we need to work on accomplishing. And I think that we can do it working together. Thank you. Um, thank you both so much. Um, I was sharing my screen because I had to show the timer on my screen, which is annoying. I am sure that I missed some correspondence during this. Um, my email is in the chat if anybody wants to share anything with me. Um, we'll try to get that out to the candidates. Um, we are posting our elections information on ggwash.org slash elections slash 2022. Um, so, you know, you can check there if you have any questions, you can also reach out to me. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, this was really great and I appreciated the time to talk. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, Alex K for moderating, <laughs> um, and for pressing you all on some really great questions. So, um, I really appreciate you spending your Tuesday evening with us and, uh, here's to getting eight minutes of your life back during a really busy season. And thank you, Lisa, as well, uh, participating. Thank you, Nate. Awesome. Have a good Thanks, day. everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs>